All right, today my guest is Jason Durham, and Jason is a Nevis grad from 1994. He's got a bachelor's in elementary education at University of North Dakota, master's from Southwest State University in Marshall. He works as a kindergarten teacher in Nevis, which he's been doing for about 23 years, but he's also been a fishing guide for the last 32 years through his Go Fish Guide service that's also out of Nevis, Minnesota. He's written two books on the subject of fishing, Pro Tactics Panfish and Pro Tactics Ice Fishing. He's also got another book that he's going to mention later to, later during this uh, podcast. He represents various companies uh, throughout the state, including Crestliner, Clam Outdoors, Mercury, Vexilar, Blackfish, Ice Armor, um, well, that's a lot. I don't know if they're, <laughs> I think I, I think that's, I mentioned. That's pretty, pretty thorough. And I read that you've been called the new hero of former governor Mark Dayton. <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. A long time ago I was. You're the new hero a long time ago. All right. Uh, he also co-hosts the Ice Team podcast weekly. And so welcome, Jason Durham, hey. to Northwestern Voices. Thanks for having me on here. So I kind of caught you between, uh, fi- well, I don't, I don't really know if this is accurate or not, but it seems like it's between fishing seasons in the middle of November. Is yeah. there is there a is there a time of year that's particularly where there's not a lot of fishing going on? In my life, not really. I mean, for most people, there's kind of that transition between open water and ice fishing on both ends of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Whether that's the ice melting in the spring and waiting for open water, or this period of time where we have where a lot of people have in northern Minnesota winterized their boats and and put them away. Looking at temperatures coming up next week mm-hmm. in the fifties. There are a lot of people that are regretting winterizing their boats. Those <laughs> hardcore anglers that are, you know, still wanting to go out and 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 have one more shot at a walleye, uh, they're kind of regretting that. Yeah, doing that. But uh, there really is no in between for me. And the reason being is that fishing is more than just being on the water for me at, at this point in my life. Working with all of those different companies, I travel a lot to different uh, trade shows. So right now we're starting to uh, have ice fishing trade shows. I've already been to one in North Ramsey. Mm -hmm. And the enthusiasm that you see (laughs) right now is incredible. Mm -hmm. Like the the number of people taking part in ice fishing has exponentially increased. Why do you think that is? A number of different reasons. Uh, I think the technology has helped a lot in terms of whether that's electronics being able to find the fish whether that's technology in terms of disseminating information. The internet can be an awful, awful thing, but it can be a glorious thing too. Mm -hmm. And getting information at people's fingertips so they have the confidence to go out ice fishing. Not everybody has the same background as people that grow up here in Park Rapids that, you know, fishing is just a way of life. It's their heritage. It's what they did ever since they were a kid. There's a lot of people that are getting into ice fishing later in life who have never done it before, but now they can learn about it instantly. I I think I fall into that category because I moved here from New York City, basically, in 2016. And I just thought to myself, well, I'm going to get into some of these hobbies. And one of the first ones I thought about when I did that was ice fishing because you didn't have to have a boat. You didn't have to, you know, you you didn't have to commit to a, a huge expenditure, you know, you get a pop up and you know you buy an auger or even just use one of those hand augers and everything but I, I i experienced exactly what you're describing just that 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 sort of uh barrier t- uh you know to entry but you get on the internet and you say oh it's actually not not as difficult or as daunting as you as you might think because of those resources right you know, your whole story is kind of like the basis for a Hallmark movie. Yeah. <laughs> Big city guy moves to northern Minnesota, right. doesn't know yeah. anything about fishing. Or hunting. Ice fishing or hunting. <laughs> or Minnesota people. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Uh, but yeah, and then and you're absolutely right that in terms of the investment to take part in it, it it's really minimal right compared to open water fishing if you if you want to get out a, in a boat or anything um, but then the other part of the technology and how that's assisted is just staying comfortable mm-hmm. that, that you can be warm whether that's the the apparel that you're wearing or the ice houses man they have changed so much in just the convenience years ago typically it would be the the male in the household 
that would be kind of trying to get enough items done on the epitome list of things to do for the home to be granted the permission to go out and ice fish, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and not to be sexist or anything like that, but that's traditionally how it was. Yeah. Now it's very, very different. There are a lot of females that are involved in fishing. There are so many more children that are involved in fishing. And now it's a family family event yeah. that they're going out into their drop-down wheelhouse. And everybody's <laughs> really doing the same things that they would do at home. They might be watching a movie together. Uh, the kids might be playing Legos on the floor. They might be playing a board game together. Yeah. But there's holes in the floor and they're actually fishing. Yeah, no, I, I guess I have mixed feelings about that because sometimes I go out, you know, to Smoky Hills or whatever and I look at these things and I'm like, my goodness, you know, like there's there's like three TVs and, yeah. you know, luxury bedding and bathrooms and showers and everything. And I just think, you know, is this is this fishing? Oh, I guess, I, I how could I say I was a purist, but I wonder what a, what a ice fishing purist would think you know, from 50 years ago would think of this, would they, would they consider it fishing or, you know? <laughs> well, you know, I think if they actually experienced it, they might change their mind. Yeah. Because I think in the past there was definitely a, a part of the focus on the rigor, the rigor that it entailed to go out and catch fish that you had to suffer a little bit in right. the cold. And that was all part of the game. But if you don't have to suffer, why suffer? <laughs> well, I guess that goes for deer hunting too, but exactly. you know, so I, you know, I, I, I talked to a few people who, uh, there's a, there's a guy at our, at our church who's, uh, uh, Rod George. I don't know if you, I, you yeah. if you know Rod oh, yeah, at all, I but do. yeah, but, uh, you know, Rod describes, you know, fishing as being going out with your auger and drilling 50 holes and, uh, walking, you know, basically with your Vexilar and checking to see, okay, is there fish in this hole? No. You move on to the next one. It's essentially like trolling, but with, you know, walking over the surface. And so I, I want like, and, and, you know, I guess the, the goal there is to try to catch fish. Just like, it's just the same goal if you're in an ice castle or something like that. But when you're stationary in a, in a, in a rig like that one, mm -hmm. you know, um, what happens if you're not in a spot where, I mean, how, how does that work in terms of like, where do you put the, the, the ice castle if you can't move it like like you could if you were drilling multiple holes all over the right. place? Right, I mean, mobility is a, definitely a term that's used a lot yeah. with ice fishing today. And, and, and it wasn't ours, but I think when you, when you go and you drop down one of the wheelhouses, and I, I use one for guiding mm -hmm. um, just because it keeps people comfortable but yeah we use it we use it as a bait a base camp got it so we, we can venture out and go fish outside too and drill 50 holes if we mm -hmm, want to mm -hmm. or jump on the snowmobile whatever um but catching fish isn't always the memorable part of fishing yeah it's it's a hundred percent about the relationships it's about the people that you're with that's how you make the memories mm -hmm. I, there's so many people that go up to lake of the woods go up to upper red lake and they catch limits of fish, and they never remember a single fish that they right. caught. Yeah, they remember other things about it. Mm -hmm. So that's where the important come the important part comes into play. Right. So, growing up in Nevis, um, I I take it that you that you grew up in Nevis. I did. Okay. Yeah. In fact, my <laughs> my, cl my classroom is two blocks from my childhood home. Your classroom is two blocks from your childhood home. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So Nevis is the best town in the in well, the country. I mean, Why? <laughs> everybody has their own opinion. But uh -huh. In my mind, in our area, all of these small communities mm -hmm. are the same community. Yeah. I mean, if you go along this Highway 34 corridor or mm -hmm. 71, everything is really home. Yeah. Yeah. From from Walker all the way down to Detroit Lakes, basically. Really? Right? And, up and up north to, and south. Up, up to Bemidji mm -hmm. and down to Monaga, Wadena. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is all just one big area where you see a lot of people that uh, you meet a ton of people, yeah. even though our populations are low, and everybody knows everybody. Right, right. And, and Park Rapids sort of in the center of it all, really, if you think about it. Is. It's at the crossroads of all those communities. Yeah, for sure. So what was your family like growing up? So I have one sister who's a couple years older. She lives in Brainerd now. And um, mom and dad, they, they always fished and they always uh, supported me in fishing. That was a big thing. Uh, 
they they allowed me to start taking our boat out on Lake Beltane. I always say I grew up on the lake, mm-hmm. but there was actually one home between our house and the water. Okay. But we were right in town, but we could see the lake. We were right next to the swimming beach. And when I was seven years old, I could start taking the rowboat out as long as I stayed in the bay and kept my life jacket on. <laughs> and, and that's where it all started. I remember one day where I told my parents, you know, I always had a, a chore list of things to do. Sure. And I told my parents, for one day, I don't want anything else to do except fish. I just want to fish all day long. And they let me do it. Yeah. And I don't think I made it through the entire day. But my mom grew up at a resort just north of Nevis, uh, Whispering Pines Resort on West Crooked Lake. And that was our family vacation, too. Mm-hmm. So we w- my grandparents sold it before I was even born. But we would drive five miles from our house and stay at a resort mm-hmm. for a week. Mm-hmm. And it was no different than if you drove six hours to a res- resort. You still had the same traditions. It was still something unique that you didn't experience every day. It was great for my dad. He worked for the postal service here in Park Rapids and carried mail through town, walked seven and a half miles on average a day, and he could still work when we were on vacation. He would go and deliver mail. And if we forgot something at home, you could just drive home and get it. But I I love that tradition, a lot of really great memories. And I don't remember a lot of fish that we caught there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some great stories and there are some standouts for sure but probably one of my best memories on on that lake was catching a stick that was about seven feet long and wanting to cut the line because i thought it was a giant northern i was probably only about eight years old and my mom said no it was just she and i in the boat my dad was working and we had one of the resort boats didn't have a motor on it we had just rowed out uh, with the oars and she wouldn't let me give up on this fish Mm -hmm. and so Mm -hmm. she eventually took the rod and fought it and i said no no i don't just cut the line cut the line and she got it up and it was about a seven foot long stick well the wind had been blowing and it blew the boat the entire way entire distance across the lake with no motor and the wind going against us yeah and she rode for over an hour to get us back to the dock and i still have that picture of that big stick and that there, for instance, is a memory I will never forget. She get it mounted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's in the woods somewhere, yeah, probably yeah. turned to earth now. But, <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know, that picture will always mm-hmm. be a great memory for me. And I don't know how many crappies we've caught out of that lake and eaten out of that lake over the years. Not like we kept limits or anything, but we, we would keep enough to eat while we stayed there. But I don't remember single fish from that. But I'll always remember that stick. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned the the rowboat, too, because we had Ren Holland in here not too long ago. wrote wrote a book on resorts in the area. Yeah, I have the book. You have the book. Okay. And his family operated a a resort, and he talked about sort of a time of transition where there was a time when it was only rowboats. And then they went to renting the outboard motors and, you know, if people owned a boat, it would be one of those rowboats. But I'm always really interested in in fundamentals of things. You know, obviously, you know, you've been doing this for quite some time. You're expert, you know, as a fisherman in the area as, as I think there is. But um, I'm always curious to, you know, get your, get people like your, you know, your your take on on some of the fundamentals. When I thought about what you said about rowboats, you know. How many anglers out there today could have a could successfully navigate a, a fishing trip out there with just a rowboat? I think there's a lot that that would be able to do that, primarily because that's how they entered into mm-hmm. fishing. So it's a, as a, far as a progression is concerned, if you were going to, you know, a child wanted to to really build some fundamentals when it came to fishing. Cause there's not, I mean, obviously there's all of the, the different knots and the tackle, what to use. I mean, there's a lot Cast, of skill casting, that goes into casting it. Casting is a big thing. Yeah. You know, um, Yarmir Yager, you said that, you know, hockey is the greatest sport cause you have to know how to do like five different things. But I mean, with fishing, it's like 500 different things that you have to be able to do well in order to be successful. But just like the whole, the whole aspect of, of, uh, controlling a boat and, you know, being safe on a boat, navigation, you know, knowing, knowing, uh, how to, how to operate a boat. It just seems like, you know, one of the fundamentals of it would be 
to go out on a boat that had no motor. <laughs> right, exactly. Understanding how the boat moves through the water using oars or a paddle is, I mean, I'm blessed that I had that opportunity that I, I didn't just jump right into a, a big fancy boat. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you this, people learn a lot more from their mistakes than they ever will from their success. That's true, yeah. And so I've made plenty of mistakes over the year, but also having people that, that you can rely on that can help educate you. I had so many great mentors. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, my parents were highly involved in my life and I'm so blessed for them. Uh, that's where I got my attribute of patience, which, you know, both fishing and teaching require right. that or guiding for sure. Um, but I had a lot of wonderful people in my life that would take me out fishing and taught me a lot of different things that maybe my parents didn't. Sure. They approach fishing in a different way. And you were talking about how, like with, with fishing, you need to know 500 different things to be successful. But I, I don't think you do. Hmm. I mean, okay. I get a lot of people that come into my boat and, and it's very different today than it was as a kid. I mean, our boat when I was a kid was a 14 foot rowboat with wooden seats, a, a six horsepower motor that we eventually got that sometimes worked and most of the time didn't. It was just <laughs> extra weight on the back of the boat to row around. Um, and now I've got a boat that is every bell and whistle you could ever imagine. Right. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it, people often comment, you know, that boat costs more than my first house. Sure. And um, when I have families that get on board, a lot of times the kids will say immediately, they'll go, Mom, Dad, we should get a boat like this. And I always tell them, you know, probably 90% of the stuff I have on here is overkill, that really what you need to catch fish is a hook and a line and water and time. Mm -hmm. And time is the biggest challenge by far, whether you're a kid or an adult. What And why is that? Because people make other things in life a priority. They don't make being in the outdoors a priority like they used to. I mean, you look at the focuses on um, sports and with no disregard to organized sports no. because they're a great, great thing. Um, but there's a lot more opportunity for kids in that regard today than there were, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So you have to make decisions about what you want to do and what you want to expose yourself to and your family to. And then, of course, technology. I mean, it's pretty easy to be comfortable and sit at home and, and turn on the TV and have 200 different channels. Yeah. Any movie you've ever, that's ever Could think been made, of. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and especially if we're talking ice fishing, when it, it, I don't know if you realize this, but it's cold outside and it's warm inside. Big, so big barrier, right? Getting yeah. that motivation <laughs> to get out of the house sometimes, that's that's difficult in itself. So you, But once you do it, I mean, yeah. especially for ice fishing, yeah. once, once you gear up, once you yeah. put on your snow pants and your boots and you go outside, you realize, wow, this is really great. You know, it's that's true. It's like, it's like with so many other things in life, it's just if you can get past that first obstacle and it's always yeah. in your mind isn't it like oh for sure like uh i've i uh i caught on to this uh like ice bath craze thing you know <laughs> have you been doing it <laughs> well the last showers yeah, and... no the uh, li like literally like a bath i i went to lnm and i bought like a hundred gallon steel uh it's like a like a watering See? trough yeah. or a cow or something yeah. like that and i filled it with water and I just wait for the temperature to to drop, you know, to where it is. And then, but yeah, last spring going it, you know, as the, well, the end of the winter and into the spring, it, it would freeze. But then when it started to unfreeze, I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. And, um, you know, cause you hear about people who, who swear by it and everything else, but it was, it's just the idea of you're standing there and usually you do it in the morning when you get out of bed or something right. like that. And it's warm and, and you're, you're feeling good and then you're looking at that thing and there's snow on the ground and there's like little chunks of ice floating in there and you're saying so i cannot do this <laughs> but i tell you though you 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 know you get in there and then you know you try to do it incrementally you do you know first time you go in there try to stay in for 10 seconds and then 20 seconds and 30 seconds but then after a while you can stay in for a whole minute and you're and you know you get out of it and you're like i just did the probably the most mentally challenging thing that that I I'm going to do today, you know, so everything yeah. else is going to be gravy, you know, but I mean, I just, it just made me think of that because, um, 
you feel great once once you get out of it and you you know you you walk back in and you warm up and everything like that but you just don't want to do it because it's cold you know when yeah you, when for you sure start. but but i found that to be true with lots of different things that especially in the winter time minnesota ice fishing definitely deer hunting is another one you know <laughs> You're just yeah. getting up at, you know, it's still pitch black out. You're walking out to that stand, you're freezing, you know, but, but then, you know, when you have the, you know, the moment where you see the deer and you're, you're like, wow, this is, you know, I know you're, I know you're not a deer hunter, but no. you know, it's just the same, it's the same kind of thing is that it's, I think anything that's, that's, you know, worth it, there's going to be some kind of a challenge or a barrier that you have to get past in yeah. order to really enjoy it. Right. And I don't think it's just with you know, the outdoors, for sure, it's anything in life. Think about people going back to school later in life. That yeah. They go, oh, I, you know, I, I don't think I can do it. I'm I'm ingrained in, in the job that I have right now or um, going on a vacation somewhere that they've always thought about. It doesn't matter what it is. Taking that leap is hard. I heard a really great quote that I love and I think about a lot. And it said, you can't drive a car if it's sitting in the driveway. And there's so much truth to mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that you just have to, sometimes you just have to, you know, start the ignition and go. And and you might not have the perfect plan yet. Right. But just start driving and it'll all fall into place. Absolutely true. Yep. I, I find that to be that, I mean, it, just even in like a, in law practice, even, you know, a lot of times people will want to say, well, here's the basic terms of the deal and, you know, we can probably do this or we, you know, we can probably do that. And, you know, at some point you just say, you know what, let's just start writing up the contract or let's just start writing up the proposed order or something like that, because then we've, then we're actually doing it. And we're, there's a process that has a goal that, that, you know, you can kind of see at that point, you know, and so you get, you, you just get started and, um, you know, like that's the, that's the first step, right? Yeah. So, and then you make refinements as you go. Yep. So um, getting started, I know, uh, were you were you working at Fuller's Bait Shop? When... Uh, no, I was actually at my uncle's bait shop in Nevis. Okay. So okay. what is now known as T&M. So there's, there's three T&M mm -hmm. stores, uh, Park Rapids, Nevis, and Akeley. Mm -hmm. And T&M, a lot of people don't realize, stands for Ted and Mary. No. And I that's my know. aunt and uncle. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> and and so they, they owned that. It was a filling station. You know, when I was a really young kid. Is that the North Winds grocery there? Or, nope, or, it's the Shell Station. The Shell Station. Yep. Okay, got yep. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually they they used to do uh, auto repair there too mm -hmm. and and small engine repair. And they took those couple bays where they used to do the, the auto auto repair and they they turned them into turned it into a bait shop. And they had a wall between the two, so it was two separate stores. There was the convenience store gas station and then there was the bait shop. And the bait shop was originally named, are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. Hookers and Hunters. <laughs> I know. I know. You know how many prank phone calls yeah, came yeah. into that shop? <laughs> a lot. A lot. Well, now, I got to ask, was that, was that done intentionally? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But I was, uh, I was working there as a teenager. I was 15 years old. And I, a, a customer came in. Uh, he was he was looking for a fishing guide and at the time we really only had one guy in the area who was a, a guide who was that and that was dick winner mm -hmm. and and dick was i mean he's legendary I, I i've learned so much from him over the years and i i wish that i had opportunities to spend time in the boat with him but just talking to him at different events and when we see each other in passing is so he's still with us then he is yeah. he is um, and unfortunately not for very long. Okay. Um, uh, Dick is really sick right now. Oh no. And, and so one of those legends, unfortunately, those stories are going to be stories, you know? Yeah. But we called up Dick to see if he was available for this, uh, customer and Dick was booked for the entire week. And so the, the customer, you know, he says, well, what do I do? And I said, well, what lake are you staying on? And he said, well, I'm on Lake Beltane. Oh, I grew up on that lake. So I got out a map and I started showing him places to mm -hmm. go. And then we started going up and down the aisles and I, I showed him different lures to use and how to use them and everything. And he finally turned to me and he said, well, why don't you just guide me? And I said, well, I'm not a fishing guide. Yeah. 
And he said, well, I'll pay you $35 for a half day. Walks like a duck and talks like right, a duck. <laughs> right. and, and at the time, you I said think $35, $35 for, for yeah. a half day. Yeah. I think I was making two seventy-five dollars minimum wage at the time. And so this sounded pretty good for sure. a four-hour trip to make $35. Yeah. And I guarantee you, I was so excited about it that I'd never made a penny because I'm sure I spent all of it on bait and things that I didn't need because yeah. um, I was hyped up. <laughs> but the trip went well, and, and then my parents helped me figure out how to start a small business. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in those first couple of years, I, I didn't do a lot of trips. Uh, I mean, obviously, when you're first starting out a business, plus you're 15 years old. Yeah. I mean, people are relying on you not to only help them catch fish, but to keep them safe in the boat. There's a lot of trust yeah. that goes into this. I didn't even have my driver's license yet. <laughs> I mean, my dad would have to launch the boat in the morning. And I'd go pick people up at the resort, and, and then he'd pick me up at the end of the day when he was done with the mail route. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll tell you, when I when I got my driver's license, boy, that opened up an entire world for me. I'm that, sure. That I could, I could go to different lakes, and I could go and explore. And actually, the first time I ever backed a boat in was on a guide trip. Mm-hmm. I had never done it before. And you see at public accesses where sometimes people struggle a little bit. And, oh, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, backing trailers is hard. <laughs> it can be. It definitely can be. And, and fortunately for me, it just it made sense and it, it went well. It wasn't a bad thing. It wasn't a negative experience in, in any regard. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then it was just history from there. I mean, every year it's gotten... Mm-hmm. I, I I would say I'm at the maximum point I could be at right now yeah. in terms of how many clients I can accommodate. And it got to the point where it was so busy that I couldn't accommodate everybody that was coming to the area. So I, I got a friend of mine, Jeremy Anderson, who's a teacher in Park Rapids. He, his nickname is Jones, and so mm-hmm. he operates Jones's Guide Service. I said, uh, you might want to think about helping me out with mm-hmm. this. And mm-hmm. he said, well, I could one or two days a week. And then pretty soon he was at five or six days a week. And and then my stepson got involved, Aaron Pappas, AJ. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's been doing it now since, I mean, as soon as he turned 16, we got him taking people out. And um, now there's eight guides in the area. And the majority of us are teachers. I Is mean, that right? Yeah. It fits well with the Why, schedule. Yeah. What, what's, how does that work? I mean, it, you know, obviously teaching is a full-time job. It's, oh, yeah. you know, exhausting, grueling, everything like that. And rewarding. And Don't rewarding. Well, I know, but I'm just well, I'm just saying in, in, in relation to having a second gig like like guiding or something like that, is that something that you do mostly during the summertime and Yeah, I mean that's when that's when we have the greatest number of tourists here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a couple of the guides and myself that do guide on the ice. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. primarily primarily Isaiah Hahn and I are the ones that guide on the ice. And that's well for for you it'd have to be the weekend, I suppose, right? Uh, I do trips after school too. Okay. So there's night a, trips and things like yeah, that. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. a lot of long days in my life. Yeah. <laughs> but but I'll tell you honestly, I don't ever work. Right. I don't ever actually work. It never feels like work, whether that's in the classroom or, or on the water. But say for instance in the spring and the fall, most days I bring my boat to school. And then in the winter, there's a lot of days where I bring the snowmobile to school and we do trips afterwards. It's nice with the ice houses now Mm -hmm. that I can have that out on a lake. Sure. And we can just pull up to it and I flip the heat on and then we don't have to do the whole setup and that whole time consumption um, as well. So it makes it convenient for the people that I'm taking out. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you just travel out by snowmobile or truck or Or something like that. Or truck, yeah. But the hard thing in our area is we don't have... Um, a lot of well-maintained roads that you can rely on. Right. I mean, on some of the bigger lakes you do, but even like Potato Lake, for instance, you can't always rely that there's going to be roads going to where you want. So I end up paying a lot of money to have roads scraped scraped into the the snow, and Mm -hmm. uh, that Mm -hmm. becomes a a huge expense. And snowmobiles, you know, that's kind of a hard thing because you don't want to put a client on a snowmobile by themselves if they're not experienced sure. because now you're putting them at risk. Yeah. And there's a, a big difference between guiding open water and guiding on the ice because the risk is much greater in the winter. You can put yourself in Is that right? some really sketchy situations yeah. for sure. I would have thought the other way for sure because the I mean, at the I mean, I suppose later in the early season ice fishing I suppose would be more risky, but I would say actually late season 
and and actually it doesn't really matter because mm-hmm. you know no ice is ever a hundred percent safe right you can't rely on that um, lakes do funky things sometimes and then just the the weather itself too I mean <laughs> there was was it two winters ago I had a husband and wife up from uh, Springfield Missouri and I adore this couple so much mm-hmm. we spend a lot of time I on think yeah you, I, you I mentioned them yeah up. at the rotary yeah yeah. <laughs> And um, they came up in February, and they fished for six days. Four of the six days, we had to get rescued off of the ice because the the trails blew in. And, you know, when the snow drifts into the road, you think, with, oh, I can just kind of power through it. It's powdery. And then when you get to the point when the snow's coming up over the hood of your truck and you can't move anymore, and now you can't even get your door open on your vehicle. Yeah. And then you just, I, I have a wonderful plow guy who who tells me you can call me anytime 24 hours a day if you're in trouble let yeah. me know yeah and with this couple too i've had two different times where um we've had slush and water on the ice and the front wheel of my truck has frozen okay so i saw this video a couple of years ago about a guy who i think it was on lake of the woods or something like that where this the same thing happened that you know you got the slush and then it freezes and he had to sit there and rotate his tires, I think, for something like eight hours straight or something like that, just to prevent the the uh, the tire from freezing. You know, I, I mean, that just seemed like a horrendous experience. You know, yeah. <laughs> and, and both of those times that the front wheel is frozen has been with this couple. Yeah. From Missouri. Yeah. And so how do you get it out of that? Uh, a lot of chipping. Uh, yeah. One thing that everybody should carry in their vehicle, whether they go ice fishing or just in the winter in general, is isopropyl alcohol. Because you can melt ice, you can melt snow. Mm. If you have a, a lock that sticks or your door is frozen shut or whatever, yeah. you pour it on there and it'll melt the ice. It does. When it's in the brake drum and everything, yeah. it still takes a long time to do it. Um, but fortunately, this couple from Missouri, they had never ice fished. They had never seen a frozen lake before until uh 2018 yeah and and i remember that first time i took them out on fishhook lake and they were taking pictures like crazy and i told them you know when you show these photos to people back home they're just going to think you're standing in a snowy field yeah you know you really don't see anything but they i mean they took video on the ice and that same trip we had gone to their first time ever up here ice fishing on an ice fishing trip we went to eighth crowing and the ice frozen in such a way that there was water on the ice, probably oh, yeah. about eight inches, but then about three inches of ice on top of that. Right. So you've got three inches of ice, eight inches of water, and then solid ice for, you know, 20, 24, 26 inches. Well, when you drive across that top layer, you're okay sometimes. And then all of a sudden you break through and water's going everywhere. Yeah. And they're driving their brand new truck out on the ice oh, no. following me. And yeah. we still laugh about it because they thought, <laughs> you know, every time we broke through, we thought we were going down. And, and, and again, putting trust in somebody, they have to put a lot of trust in me that I'm going to keep them safe. And there are times, too, where I have people that want to go really late in the season or really early in the season. And I just have to make the call and say, no, we're not going to go. Or if the weather turns. And you, you hate that for people who, who come here to vacation and they've invested that time and that financial part of it too to get here um, accommodations and then the weather doesn't cooperate but ultimately you need to make the right decision because Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you need to keep everybody safe of course yeah and uh yeah that's a that's a big thing i think when you're explaining ice fishing to people who who don't have any experience with it you're talk. You're telling them you're gonna drive a pickup truck out on yeah. the lake of it, you know. And it, I, I, I'm still affected by this because I don't like driving my truck out on the ice, no matter what, you know. I mean, and that's okay. I, I think the only time I ever, I have ever done it, I've done it twice, but I was just done it on Lake Itasca because they always have such a clear path out on there, you know. And and you know they get that plowed from one entry point to the other and everything like that, and so I don't have a problem with it, but. I just don't want to be stuck out there, right. you know. So, right. so I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll do little st- stuff like, uh, you know, pull a sled out onto uh, Portage Lake in the, kind of the earlier season and stuff like that, and try to fish for northerns and everything else. But I, you know, like I'm not, I'm uh, definitely not as, uh, ri- you know, as much of a risk taker when it comes to that stuff, you know. Especially because I just, like, why did I drive on this ice and I, you know, the, you know, I'm out of the truck, but my truck's going down. I mean, I just have this this image in my head of, you know. Right. But it's good to have a certain level of fear. Did, did, if you're, 
maybe you know this. If your truck goes through the ice and you've got collision and comprehensive oh, yeah. on your truck, I'm sure you get this question all the time. I, 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 I don't so much, but I see it online quite a bit. And yeah. from what I understand, and it depends on the carrier and whatever, um, I, I I, I you can't quote me on it, but no, no, I know, no. I, I know, I, I know you don't know. So uh, absolutely not. Nobody's holding you to this. I right. just want to know what you think. Um, well, I, I thought what I had heard is that uh, insurance will cover it the first time, but if it happens again, that there's no. Yeah. But it's a it's very expensive to get the vehicle out of. Yeah, because you have to hire a com- a specialized company oh, to yeah. come out and. Yep. Yeah. Um, I interviewed a guy, a local guy from Park Rapids. Uh, several years ago, I was writing for the Park Rapids Enterprise. I used to do a, a column on Saturdays that was all fishing related. I did uh-huh. it for like seven or eight years. And this guy actually had his vehicle go down on Little Pine Lake by Purim. Uh, they were going out to fish Tulabi, And it was himself and a friend and the friend's uh, grandson. And they went, the truck went through in 50 feet of water. And they everybody got out safely. And I said... He told me, he said, when we pulled the grandson out of the back seat, we pulled him out the, the driver's side window and the window was level with the ice oh. at that point. And I said, how long did this take? Like, how long did it take for the truck to go down? Yeah. And he said, 30 seconds. And the Is truck, that why they say you don't wear the seatbelt when you're... Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so the, the truck sank to the bottom in 50 feet of water and di- they had divers go down to retrieve it. And they couldn't figure out why the ice was thin because there was a lot of ice. There was, you know, like 30 inches of ice throughout the lake. And why was this spot weak? Uh, the only thing they could figure out is there were schools of tulipy that were, you know, just continually kind of circling in the area. And I mean, just any the friction type of from that artificial movement? current. I mean, anytime you have moving water, it's just like in your driveway. Uh, you know, when you when the ice starts to melt, any type of water running is going to cut trails in there. And the same can be said under, under on the, the other side, too, right? right? Exactly. Underneath. So, uh, but the interesting thing about it was uh, they got the truck out and his friend still drove it. But I interviewed the man. His the truck fr- was submerged. It they was all it out. the bottom. They pulled it out and the guy then tuned it up, still drove it. Okay. But I, but I went to interview this man uh, on his first trip out on the ice after that incident, because he waited a few years. He was too scared to go fish on the lake again. And I met him on Sixth Crowing. And here's about decision making, okay? This is his first time going out again. And he's feeling confident about this. So I go to interview him after school. And at that time, I had my truck. But then our family also had this little five-speed Volkswagen Passat. And... (laughs) Having taught kids for eight hours, I'm driving to the lake, I'm kind of daydreaming, thinking about some of the questions I'm going to ask this guy. And I'm in my school clothes. Like, I have yeah. dress shoes on. Sure. I don't. I didn't bring my boots or anything. Yeah. I'm just going to drive out and talk to him yeah. and drive off. Well, I'm not thinking about it. I have the car, not my truck. Uh-huh. And I drive right out onto the lake, and I probably go 100 feet and bury that car. Oh, no. It just <laughs> buried. So I walked out in my dress shoes, interviewed him, then had to call a buddy for help. Yeah. And it took us two hours to get the, the vehicle uh, off of the ice, but but we did it. Yeah. But again, I mean, that was just such a, you know, foolish decision. Yeah, yeah. But I just, I wasn't thinking. And you can get in those situations. You got to think. And, and I didn't. You know, and, and I'm it's, experienced. And, and it's always stuff like just being, you know, because I this happened, uh, this almost happened to me about, I think it was two or three years ago um, on Mille Lacs. I, my, my buddy from the city's got a construction company and every year they have this, um, you know, they basically have like an employee gathering out on, on Mille Lacs and Mm -hmm. he says, Hey, why don't you just come out, you know, come out and, and, uh, and join us. We have fun. You know, they set up like, you know, whatever it is, a hundred tip ups and everything. And people just kind of sitting around and, you know, fires and whatever, having a beverage and all that. And then looking around and watching it, the flags come up and all that. But I said, well, at the time I had a Corolla and I had a truck and I said, hey, you know, can I, can I drive my Corolla out there? He's like, oh yeah, no, you know, don't worry about it, <laughs> you know? And, and it was the reason why I decided not to bring my truck was because I just thought, oh, you know, I'll save a little bit of money on gas and sure. I'll drive over there. It just, it was just like, and then I got out there and of course I got stuck and it took like four or five of the people there to help me push it out and everything. And I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, like, you know, if I would have just driven my truck, 
yeah, I would have had to pay maybe another 30 or 40 bucks for gas, but I wouldn't have had to go through this thing. And I, I kind of feel like that's where a lot of times where we make mistakes in life is that we're trying to take a, some kind of a shortcut or just thinking, you know, thinking well, about how to do things the easier easy, way. The easy way. When, yeah. when I was a kid, I always wanted to fish other lakes and living in Nevis, I, yeah. I thought, well, in the winter, boy, it'd be so convenient if I could just get on my bike. Yeah. And so I tried that. I put the chisel across the handlebars. I had a backpack with my ice fishing poles and everything went okay until I got to the lake and that plowed road. And then those tires just came just right spin. out from under me. And <laughs> man, with the chisel on the handlebars, and that I took a pretty, uh, pretty good spill and I didn't bike to the lake anymore. Okay, so let, let me get a little bit more philosophical with you here. So I've got a statement here. It like says <laughs> it says that early humans began fishing for food as lo- as far back as 40,000 years ago. And then it also says that the first recorded instance of fishing dates back to about 30,000 BC. Um, why do you think that fishing has been such a huge part of the human experience for all these years? Well, I mean, back then it was about subsistence. It right. was about living. And mm-hmm. then it translated into heritage and became really a pastime for people as enjoyment. Mm-hmm. That they could they could stock this animal and outsmart it, even though it's got a brain much smaller than ours. Right. I mean, I don't care what lake you go on around here. Yeah. The biggest fish in the lake has a brain about the size of a single pea. Uh-huh. Not the pod, just the single <laughs> the pea. pea. So they can't they can't contemplate or decide. They can't learn things. Uh-huh. What drives me nuts are when people say, oh, you know what? The, the fish in this lake are so hard to catch because the water's so clear and they've seen every lure in the tackle box. Yeah. They don't recall that. <laughs> they don't. So and they don't have memories. No, and they they do, but it's it's seconds. Yeah. It's literally like three seconds, three or four seconds. Okay. But uh, even in clear water, and people always blame clear water. All of our lakes here are clear, mm-hmm. ultra clear. Mm-hmm. They Those fish still need to eat. Yeah. They still have requirements for diet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, for me with fishing, water is what grounds me. And whether it's frozen or whether it's open in a boat, that's where I go uh, to, to really recharge. Mm-hmm. It's where I find solace. When there's something negative that happens in my life, usually mm-hmm. it's, it revolves around, you know, someone close to me who's passed away. Sure. I retreat to the lake instantly. Mm-hmm. And that's where I find myself close, really closest to God. Mm-hmm. And I, a few years ago, there was a guy that I knew on social media. Okay. I had never actually met him. But you end up connecting with all these people because you have a joint passion, right? You're involved in fishing, and so people will become friends with you, and, and you see their lives unfold. And this guy was really into it. Almost every day he'd post fish pictures. Well, one day he went online and said, um, I've decided that I'm going to get off of social media. He said, fishing has become a false idol for me. And so you're no longer going to see fish pictures. And I've decided to recommit myself to the Lord. Mm-hmm. Well, it was a couple of days later that I had a guide client out who was actually a pastor. Mm-hmm. And I said, hey, what do you think about this? I mean, is, is fishing a false idol for me? Do I need mm-hmm. to give it up? Mm-hmm. And he said, let me tell you this. I would rather have somebody out in the boat thinking about God mm-hmm. than having somebody in church mm-hmm. thinking about fishing. Hmm. I said, so I don't have to give it up. And he said, I think it would be more of a sin to do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a that's a completely whole different can of worms if we want to talk <laughs> oh, about that. Sure. I will tell uh, you this, yeah. though. You know, on guide trips, two things that we uh, avoid is talking about religion and talking about politics. politics. There you go. Politics. Bingo. Ding, 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 Leave ding, those ding. Untrue. Those are difficult here's, subjects. Here's the beauty, though. And talking about how how fishing relates to my life is that and anybody has this choice, you can take any problem or issue in your life and you can bring it out on the water with you and you can solve it at that moment Mm -hmm. or you can leave it on shore Mm -hmm. and it's your choice. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Okay. Since we're taught, because this, the first, that first kind of question was sort of a setup to this idea of subsistence fishing, right? Yes. Yeah. 
And this, these techniques include hand gathering, spearing, netting, angling, of course, yep. and trapping. Mm -hmm. Have you tried all of these techniques? Um, yeah, probably. I mean, gathering. I don't know about <laughs> hand, gathering. Hand gathering. Hand gathering. Yes. I mean, I've tried as a uh -huh. kid, probably at the swimming beach okay. and whatever. But reach in and uh, my so my dad and I actually went catfishing this uh, August, this mm -hmm. last August. I wasn't really uh, motivated to do it, but he really wanted to, and so we went with a friend of mine who's a catfish guide up in Grand Forks on the Red River. And, um, and his name's Brad Durek, and Brad has been a guide for as long as I have. Uh, I don't know anything about catfishing. I had never mm -hmm. caught a catfish at mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. Well, when we were out there, my dad mentioned noodling, catching catfish by hand. And Brad pretty much got offended by it. And I didn't know this, that noodling is actually a really negative thing, that on some of these shows that you see or on the internet, what they don't tell you is they're doing that. That's taking place when the catfish are spawning. And so really oh. what they're doing is they're, they're finding their nests and they're uh -huh. moving their hands on their nest to try to agitate them uh -huh. to bite your hand. In fact, some people will actually put like um, sections of culvert into rivers to try to get the catfish to spawn in that area so they know exactly where it's at. So they can, okay. So that's not fair to the fish. That's then. not fair to the fish. Yeah. So, and, and I didn't know this. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I had, I had never really been attracted to the idea of having a catfish bite onto my hand anyway. No, that doesn't sound uh, But uh, But, you know, trap trapping fish, I've mm -hmm. never really trapped fish. Oh, no, I take that back because I've, I've assisted the DNR on several different projects yep. that they've done. We've gotten to do trap netting. We've gotten to do electro fishing, which is wild that's like that's like you see on uh in movies and stuff where they throw a stick of dynamite in the water and <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little bit different a little bit different uh, you know it's putting electrical current into the water and uh -huh. we've, we've done it for muskies a couple times i've been with yeah and we've done it for largemouth bass uh the interesting thing is i i love being on those trips with the dnr because you've got a fisheries biologist with you and they know the answer to every question that I have. Right. So I just talk nonstop the whole night. Uh -huh. But one thing I asked about the electrofishing was, uh, what's the mortality rate? When you're shocking these yeah. fish, how many of the fish die? And they said, zero. 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 There's no mortality. Interesting. But they said they probably wake up with a pretty good headache. The next yeah, day. I bet. Yeah. And <laughs> when, we, when we electrofish for muskies, we're actually targeting specific fish. So you, it's all they're, done. they're tagged or whatever. Or? No, it's it's all done after dark. So you're using spotlights to see into the water, okay. and it's all conducted in less than six feet of water. The musky uh, uh, electro fishing is done in the spring when they're spawning, or, or right after it. A lot of times. Um, What's the purpose of this, by the way? Uh, so you get population assessment. Uh, mm -hmm. You can look at genetics. Okay. Um, all of that size mm -hmm. structure, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, Kind of lost my train of thought there for a second, which happens. Yeah, no, you're age. just talking about but, the yeah. electro, electro, the electro uh, fishing and yeah. the, the mortality. So we're we're actually targeting specific fish. So you're driving in less than six feet of water. You spot a fish with the spotlight, and you tell the driver over this way, you know, to the right or whatever, and they drive over there. You have to get within about six or eight feet of the fish, and then you step on this pedal. It increases the current because you're running a consistent DC current in it. Uh, through the water, but it's a mild current. Mm -hmm. But then, as soon as you step on the uh, step on this pedal, it increases the current. I might have it backwards; it might be an AC current. Yeah. Either way, uh, and then you shock this fish, and it looks like it died. I mean, it goes upside down; its gills flare. When you net it, it's stiff, uh, and then you're able to conduct these different studies. They'll insert a tag to a subdermal mm -hmm. tag mm -hmm. underneath the skin, but when you're doing the electrofishing for bass, then you're running that current hot the entire time so you're continually to travel continually traveling in the shallow water but you've got this high current going so it's non-discriminatory anything so you can all kinds of species anything that yeah you, that hits that current yeah you shock yeah including turtles frogs muskrats and, yeah. frogs yeah. uh what was interesting to me is carp really don't get affected too much by it it's not like when you hit a bass, again, yeah. it goes upside down, kind of floats up a little bit. Carp, they just kind of. They're eh, tough. Eh. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. 
So here's where I had a curious question. So in a post-apocalyptic scenario, and there is no DNR. <laughs> I love this. What would be the best way to harvest fish as a sure thing? Well, that would be a gill net. Okay. Because a gill net is just like a wall that has holes anywhere from like a quarter inch to an inch and a quarter. And you, you put that out in the water and anything that swims into it, and it's pretty invisible, yeah, uh, is going to get tangled up in the net. Okay, okay. So, so, so all, of the, all of these doomsday preppers, they should get a gill net, but yeah, they should never yeah. use it. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you should have it on hand. Uh -huh. I don't know what the legality is of owning a gill net and not using it. Um, well, but I'm, I was I'm thinking, sure you could probably own a gill net you know, for, you know. You probably wouldn't have to go as extreme as like post-apocalyptic, you could say. <laughs> like if you were on the show alone uh -huh. and, yeah. and you had to harvest these fish, how would you do it? Right. Still, right. Gill, gill net. That would be the, the, the best way to, to guarantee success. I mean, yeah. dynamite would work too. Yeah. <laughs> It was. I mean, that's. It a, depends on what that you would have be on illegal. Hand. That would be illegal, probably. To but not post-apocalyptic. Well, yeah. Then, then all bets are off, right? right. Yeah. Okay. Um, ha have you ever read *The Complete Angler* by Isaac Walton? Have you ever heard of that book? In my house, I actually have a shelf that is a fishing library, uh -huh. and *The Complete Angler* is one of the books on there. So that book was written in 1653, yeah. and. A lot of times when people talk about, because that was, we're, we've been kind of mentioning subsist, subsistence fishing and fishing for food and things like that. But then when it comes to recreational fishing, they mark that year in that book as sort of being the, the dawn of recreational uh, fishing, which really kind of, it's interesting because uh, it means that the sport is really less than... 400 years old, you know? So if you've been doing it for 30, 30 years, you know, I mean, that's almost, you know, at least six or 7% of the entire existence of fishing and all that. But it's just kind of funny when you think about it, um, you know, that it is a relatively new sport. Um. Yeah. I mean, in reality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and just, I think about how recreational fishing has changed in the last 40 years mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and how much it's going to change advancements in yeah advancements in, advancements in the last 40 years think about how much it's advanced in that period of time. since that time yeah but talking about but, subsistence fishing um I, I went up to i've been up to alaska a few different times and one year i went up there and actually ice fished which was really interesting to me mm -hmm. Uh, I went into a Dick's Sporting Goods up in Fairbanks mm -hmm. because I wanted to see what they had on hand for ice fishing yeah, equipment. Is it going to be, be comparable to mm -hmm. what we've got here and whatever? And they, they had a small section there of ice fishing equipment. Something that was really surreal to me was being so many miles from home in this place that's so remote. And I go into the Sporting Goods store and I find an ice fishing rod and my picture's on the tag of it. No way. <laughs> it was just like, what is happening? Yeah, yeah. It's it uh -huh, weird. Uh -huh. But in Alaska, ice fishing is a lot different than here. You don't see that whole recreational aspect of right. it very often because people are using those fish for subsistence. Right. In fact, you can get a subsistence license up there for $5. If you can prove that you need that fish to survive, mm -hmm. it's 5 bucks for a year. Wow. But you can also rent a fish house up there for $5 a day from the DNR. You have to cut the hole yourself, and you have to bring the wood for the fire, but you can go rent a house up there. Hmm. I didn't do that. I fortunately had a, a guy that I knew who was a guide up there who took me out. Mm -hmm. And um, when he started the auger, he had to stand on the tailgate of his truck, and he said, because of the extensions mm -hmm. and how tall this auger well, was. How dumb, so, the, so the ice must have been super thick. He said, we're really lucky this year because there, it's been a warm winter, so there's not as much ice. This year, there's only five feet. <laughs> he said, usually there's six or more. Wow. But uh, people up there uh, during the winter are, are staying inside a lot. And they're harvesting the majority of their fish for the winter during the open water season when it's easiest to do. But they'll mm -hmm. do things like netting, like mm -hmm. hoop netting, uh, salmon, which is legal at certain times. Sure. But they'll stock up their freezers because they need to. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're talking about fish psychology here. And 
I, you know, when I was looking at that book, I was trying to see if there was anything in there that we could discuss. But, you know, that book is just, it's a lot of it is just poetry and stuff like that. And, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. But there's, there's, uh, there's also a, um, several chapters are written on specific fish. Mm -hmm. And some of them I wasn't familiar with, to be honest. I never heard of these fish. But one of the fish that he writes about is the pike. And he says, the pike is also observed to be a solitary, melancholy, and a bold fish. Melancholy because he always swims or rests himself alone and never swims in shoals or with company, as most other fish do. And bold because he fears not a shadow or to see or be seen of anybody, as the trout and chub and all other fish do. Is that still an accurate statement about the northern pike? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Northerns are, are kind of two-faced, uh -huh. really. They're a stealthy predator that will stalk prey, uh, but they will also, um, you know, eat anything that's dead off mm -hmm. of the bottom mm -hmm. that they can just easily find. And um, in terms of them not traveling together in schools, they really don't. Yeah. But there are definitely times that you find them in the same areas, and mm -hmm. it's all relative to food. Yeah, yeah. You know, especially on these small lakes, multiple species will use certain areas if there's a lot of forage mm -hmm. available or forage in addition to the right structure, then you've got a really great combination. But yeah, I mean, sure. there's there's definitely times where we get in areas and we catch multiple, multiple pike mm -hmm. without even moving the boat. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I looked for a section on uh, walleye and muskie and stuff like that in that book, and it's just not there, but yeah. <laughs> maybe because they didn't have those fish in England. But. Well, that's the thing, too, is that, you know, all of this is based, all of that book is based upon the region where Isaac Walton was fishing, really. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it really wasn't encompassing a lot of worldwide feedback. Yeah, I because, think he fished in a river a lot, too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And so that was just their perspective. So even talking about fishing as a sport um, at that time frame, that was the time frame for where he's at. Mm -hmm. It could have been a sport somewhere else earlier, later. We don't know. The internet didn't yeah. exist. Then. I don't know no. if you know this, but the internet didn't <laughs> exist in the 1600s. Yeah. So it was harder to figure out. Well, if he didn't write a book about it, I mean, how is it, how right. would it ever be preserved? I mean, but somebody right. definitely taught him how to fish. Well, and if it's, if it's on the internet, it's true. And if it's in a book, it's true too. So it must all be fact. So we're getting, so we're getting a little short on time here. So I uh, I wanted to to uh, uh, segue into talking a little bit about your being a kindergarten teacher. Yeah. Um, so I I was looking on the internet as we were talking about <laughs> about, and I was looking for the qualities of a good kindergarten teacher. Mm. And uh, <laughs> when I read this list, I thought to myself, wow, that's such an amazing, because it, because it seems as though there's uh, so many of these that overlap um, with the qualities of a good fisherman as well. So I'll read them to yeah. you and you can yeah. tell me if you agree. Uh, patience, obviously, uh, yeah. number one, we talked about that yeah. one. Uh, creativity, compassion, enthusiasm, organization, and flexibility. It's interesting because I think we've already talked about all of those in some way. You know, I would say in terms of organization, uh -huh. I, I have to be very organized about my time. That I, I always have to think three steps ahead. Mm -hmm. Like if, I, if I'm going to school in the morning, I have to think about the bait that I have for after school. Right. I have to think about the food. I, I Time always, management. Time management. I carry what I call my emotional support lunch cooler. <laughs> and it's always with me. I always have food with, because one of my fears is like being hungry when I'm out guiding. Oh yeah. Um, but <laughs> in terms of organization, like uh, in my boat, I don't have, you know, every tackle box with a label maker, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. indicating what exactly is inside and all the colors in the same columns. Uh, so I think flexibility and creativity, they're almost, uh, they almost conflict with each other a little bit hmm. because with that creativity, you have to be so flexible. Well, I should say flexibility and creativity mm -hmm. uh, kind of conflict with it. You have to be able to, to roll three or 180 immediately. Yeah. Whether that's in the classroom or that's, out on the water. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I get limited by in the boat is my clients or not even in the boat on the ice too, that and, and probably more so on the ice that you might have a client that shows up that isn't as mobile ice fishing. 
that if we're planning to put out tip-ups because they want to catch northern pike, that they can't physically trudge through the snow to get to it quick enough uh, to catch that fish and, and still give that fish a chance to survive if we want to release it. So you really do have to sometimes totally change your game plan on the spot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Flexibility. Flexibility. Yeah. F- flexibility for sure. And then and then because of that, you have to be creative in, in you know, figuring and, and, out what you're going to do next, I and suppose. And you do right? have to be organized in that you have to have backup plan upon backup yeah. plan. You really do. You talked about compassion just now when you're talking about, you know, giving the, the, the fish a chance to survive. For right? sure. The whole ethics and conservation is a big part of mm-hmm. it. I think a lot of people have the misconception with a fishing guide that they're going out and keeping limits of fish. Yeah. And and though there are probably guides in the state that do that on a regular basis on some of these bigger bodies of water where there's more fish and not going to make as much of an impact, we rarely talk about limits. Yeah. I mean, we, we are definitely preaching uh, mm-hmm. conservation to clients and and even about size of fish to keep that we want to get those genetics back in the water and and not just for reproduction that it's giving somebody else the chance to catch that big fish Mm -hmm. that same fish right yeah and like it's you know we've talked about it's that's not subsistence i'm sorry i keep struggling with that word it's not subsistence but it's a recreational sport and it's and it's not just the act of catching the fish i think you've emphasized that several times here it's it's very interesting so did you ever consider any other grades, um, teaching any other grades aside yeah. from kindergarten? Yeah. And I, what, what caused you to sort of land on kindergarten? When I first went into education, um, I was up at the University of North Dakota, and I didn't know what I wanted to teach. Um, I was working at the YMCA at the time, and I had the opportunity to work with especially young kids. But through my field work in the education program, I got to work with any kids that were from you know, really kindergarten up to sixth grade. And I just found that I liked those younger kids a lot more just because they were so curious about the world. I mean, and everything was exciting for them. And I remember a lot of my childhood from a very, very, very young age. Um, And I just remember the level of excitement of excitement that I had about the world. I'll, I'll give you an example. Okay, every spring when the snow melts, dandelions grow, right? And as adults, we go out into our yards and we poison them. We don't want we don't want those in our yards, those weeds, those awful things. Kindergartners don't look at them as weeds. They look at them as this beautiful flower. And they go and they pick them and they're excited because the, these flowers are everywhere. Mm-hmm, these beautiful mm-hmm. flowers are everywhere. <laughs> and they come up and they give you a bundle of them thinking that, you know, you're going to have this Dixie cup of a bouquet of dandelions on your desk, even though they're not going to survive. Yeah. But uh, the first snow every year, that if you think about a, a five-year-old child, they maybe remember the previous winter or the winter before, maybe. Yeah. But it's almost like the first time for them. Sure. They've had so little experience with it that it is wonderment when, and for adults, it snows the first time and we yeah, curse. Yeah. We curse. <laughs> this is the beginning yeah. to months of yeah. dreadful shoveling. Suffering, yeah. <laughs> shoveling <laughs> everything else, right? right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I love you, you, ever, you ever get down in the winter or anything like that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do, yeah. absolutely. I in do fact, too. Yeah. In fact, I, I yeah. have seasonal affective dis- disorder. Yeah. And I've known that since I was in college. And there's just some things I do to combat it. Oh, I, have really? to, I have to be really diligent about, I have to be diligent about my diet, uh-huh. about exercise, about sleep, yep. about yep. light. Yeah. Because I, my body goes through some really crazy things. I'm on the water yeah. from sun up to sundown every day in the summer. Yeah. And then all of a sudden fall hits and yeah. I'm in a school building. Getting access to sunlight is Ooh. really hard in the winter time. Yeah, isn't it? for sure. Yeah. And so that's another time when you have to put the car and drive and you have to make yourself go outside, take a walk outside. Yeah. Absolutely. Get your heart rate up and it'll make you feel so much better. What what kind of diet things do you do in the wintertime? I have to avoid carbs. Oh, really? I, I have to be very diligent about that. Carbs yeah. and sugar. And so high protein, lots of vegetables. Yeah. And just making sure. And I take a multivitamin too. And I do sure. take vitamin D. Yep. Yep. Um, but I think the combination of all of it. Avoiding carbs helps. in the wintertime. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Okay. I, I, I ought to try that. And it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it's, hard. it's really hard. It's hard when you walk well, into the teacher's lounge and they've <laughs> and, just opened a brand new you know, donut shop in Nevis and there's a big 
box of them. And that's like it is here, you know, and yeah. we get we get like four boxes of cookies every Tuesday and it's like, yeah. you know, it's that it's that between breakfast and lunch and you know, you still got your coffee. Right. But um but you know what? I, I absolutely think you're right that I think carbs definitely especially in the wintertime tend yeah. to bring us down. They make us tired, they make us want to yeah. sleep, they just bring everything down. So good good tip there. Um so um maybe this is a good place to ask this question. So I I saw you that you have a TikTok and that <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> and I you're do. really pushing people to eat peanut, peanut butter. butter. <laughs> There's a reason. Okay. I love peanut butter. Okay. <laughs> I just do. I could eat it on anything. In fact, uh, with kindergarten, uh -huh. uh, getting kids to try new foods is a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I keep a jar of it under my desk. Do you? Yeah. And, is that a their... peanut butter spoon and everything? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I will, I will sometimes put peanut butter on uh, whatever we have for school lunch. doesn't matter what. Peanut butter on lasagna. Yeah. And show them that I can try this. Right. And if I don't like it. I don't have to eat the rest of it. Right. Or I, and I don't have yeah. to try peanut butter on the whole piece of lasagna. You know, yeah. I can take a little bite of it and just trying to get them to experiment That's with it. That's such a good thing to do to try to get people to try different foods, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's and uh, and I, I would also keep a, a bottle of mustard under there, too. Uh-huh. And, and I get the kids, sometimes they try things that are out of their comfort zone. Uh-huh. But it's just getting out of that comfort zone. Um, what is the best kind of peanut butter? Depends on what you're utilizing it for. Okay, let's I, I, I would let's, say, talk, let's okay, let's go let's let's run through it. Let's say I, you, the first one you're is just the one you're going to eat straight. You're gonna uh, eat with Smucker's this, natural. Smucker's natural. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. I know you're going to say creamy or, cream, or chunky. Yep, yep. Uh, both. They both have a place <laughs> okay. for certain things. Yeah, I have a jar of both in my house. Okay, and then there's this uh, crazy Richards. 100% uh -huh. peanuts, which is just peanuts. There's yeah. nothing else added. No, no sugar. Oil. No oil. No. Yeah. And uh, that one is drinkable. You can actually, once you mix it, you can drink it right out of the jar. It's okay. not great for sandwiches because it just runs all over the place. That was my next question. So what kind of peanut butter are we using for sandwiches? Well, the problem is I, I really <laughs> love Jif peanut butter. Yeah. But a lot of those kind of mainstream peanut butters do have, you know, like. A ton some, of sugar. Uh, yeah. And, and some other things that are added. Mm -hmm. um, monosaturated oils. Yeah, poly, all those whatever, things that yeah. that aren't so great. But sometimes we eat things that aren't so great. Isn't and, it true? In moderation, it's probably okay. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Okay. So, Jif, so uh, what I took away from that is Jif is better than Skippy and Peter Pan. Hands down. Okay. I think everybody <laughs> knows that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Last question here because we got to wrap things up. But um, do you have any general advice for – Young people. When I say young yeah. people, I'm not talking about kids. I'm talking about you know maybe somebody like Caleb's age here. 19 yeah, I years do. Old. Yeah, I do. Uh, the biggest thing is there's you're going to meet a lot of people in life, whether that's fishing or or with anything, that are more successful than you are. They might have more money than you do. They might have a nicer boat than you have, um, a, a job that they love more than you do, but you can still celebrate their success without having jealousy or feeling like you um, are less of a person because you're not in that position, that you are important, that you have an important role in life and finding happiness in that spot that you're at is, it's huge. It's huge. I, I think back to when I was in college. College is still my favorite time of my life. I would go back to college in a heartbeat. And it's the poorest someone will ever be in their entire lifetime, where a dollar felt like a hundred dollars. And if you can find happiness in that and get away from the idea that things and money create happiness, then you're going to be a lot more successful in life. Oh, that is such good advice. Well, Jason Durham, um, thank you for, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And um, oh, did you have a book? That you, are you are you having? A new I was book just going to bring. Out? I yeah. was going to bring it up, and this okay. is a book that I've talked about for quite a while now because the other two books that I've written were all about fishing, and mm -hmm. this one has nothing to do with fishing. Okay, it's actually the funny stories from my kindergarten class. Oh, and my goal, and I'm I'm going to make this happen, is to publish this and then have the proceeds go into our scholarship fund to help our kids because they're the ones that created the stories sure. anyway. But it'll be very entertaining. But I'll, sh I'll share a quick one, one of my favorites with you, where 
I had uh, two kindergarten boys that walked up to each other face to face in front of my desk. And one reached into his mouth and he wiggled his front tooth and he says, I've got a wiggly tooth. And the other boy says, my mom doesn't have any teeth. <laughs> and the first boy says, she doesn't have any? And he says, well, she used to, but she doesn't anymore. And the first thought out of this kid's head, he goes, well, she can't even eat Doritos. She just has to suck the taste out of them. <laughs> Not like, how did she lose them? Yeah, I bet yeah, she got yeah, a lot of money yeah, from the Tooth Fairy, just them. straight to Doritos. Doritos yeah. So if you, want a, <laughs> if you want a good laugh, yeah. uh, we'll get that in print. Okay. And, and it'll any, be any idea when that might be? I, my problem, my biggest challenge with this book is cutting off the stories and saying, this is enough. Mm -hmm. I've, I've got mm -hmm. probably 200 of them on my computer right now. But every week there's more stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm just going to have to keep accumulating them and eventually have a second edition. Good. Okay, so you'll let us know when that I happens. Will. All right. I will. Again, thank you, Jason Durham, and we'll see you the next time. Thanks for having me on. All right, good.